I just started studying baptism and, and uh, something that I found uh, this afternoon as I was lo- reading is that, uh, you know, baptism represents a promise to the cloud of witnesses that you're going to fight to bring the city down. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a declaration also to the demonic realm. And I think that's why it's so fought against and why those, you know, Kathy mentioned those two religions that, were, that hate it when you get baptized. They disown you because it rep- it's supposed to represent that you're going to fight for the rest of your life because they can't resurrect unless the church walks in the victory that Jesus paid for. You know, there's a belief out there, there's a church out there, there's a religious concept out there that we're all just sitting around waiting for Jesus to come back. Well, he's waiting for his church to do something in order to bring him back. And most of the church won't fight. You know, they, they att- they're in and out of church, they attend on Christmas and Easter, and, and they hear a sermon, but there's really no fight in their life to, this is what, and this is why Paul suffered the persecution. He wasn't just preaching like they do today, that one day there's going to be a resurrection. That was coupled, that, or that, that resurrection was coupled with the fact that they had to fight to bring the city down. You know, the city that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. That's our calling. That's what the church's job is, is to end this present system, bring another system in. You know, God said to Jesus, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So he's seated at the right hand till the enemies are made the footstool. Well, who's going to do that? Who's attached to the head? The body. So until the body puts the enemies of Christ under his feet, he he ain't getting up. He's not he's not leaving the seat beside beside God until the church puts the enemies under its feet. And so you can find a lot of people that'll attend church. They hear a sermon, but they're not fighting to bring for a system. So when you said war songs, you know, I thought, hey, I gotta, I'm gonna go ahead and say this. So when you get baptized, you have to re- you have to understand that this is not something we do frivolously. And that's one of the reasons that. You know, they need to be of age that they understand, hey, I'm making a a commitment for the rest of my life to fight for the city and die in faith like they did in the book of Hebrews. It said, these all died in faith, not having received the promise. But what were they looking for? They were looking for the city whose maker and builder was God. That that means it must be available in this life. Okay? So let's keep that in mind uh, when we go as we're contemplating baptism, is you're making a commitment, and it's, it, the Scripture says it's better not to vow than to vow and not pay. So if you're going to make a vow to be baptized, to fight for the city, you better be ready to, to make that commitment for the rest of your life. Amen? And that's why it's hard for me with children, because they're not old enough. You know, the, when they hit teenage years, what are they going to be doing? Food, yeah, huh? Hopefully, but you know, most of them get involved with food, fun, and entertainment, and God goes out the window. So, you know, you need to know, understand what you're doing. So, I just wanted to share that tonight. Since we're going to have fight songs, I mean, I think all songs are war songs. You know what I mean? Even the the slow praise and worship, that's still a war. But when you say war songs, I have a tendency to think it's going to be, you know. Okay? Yes. Okay, so I've been reading um, Danny Silk's Culture of Honor book for quite a while now. I, like, do a chapter, and then I get sidetracked, and then I do a chapter. But I was reading it this morning, and so I sent this to the Tuesday prayer group. The chapter I am in now is talking about revolution, which, if you all remember, a year ago, was it last January? A year ago in January. Will be two years this January? Okay. So we, were, we felt like that God was wanting us to pray for the leaders of our country. And, of course, at that time, the election was going to be that November. And as we were praying, Danielle heard this is a revolution, right? Revolution. And so we, we've heard that word a lot since then, over and over. So as I'm reading this book this morning, he is talking about a revolution, and he has the definition. And the definition is 
a forcible, pervasive, and often violent change of a social or political order by a sizable segment of the country's population. And as I read that, I just thought of, look at what our country is going through. This, you know, we've got some things really messed up in our country, and we are going through a forcible, violent change in our country. So I shared that, and then Danielle went, and she came up with the scripture, you know, that um, the, he the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, and the violent take it by force. And then I said that I could hear the war drums pounding, and they're like, and she came back and said, we're over here listening to war drums right now. They were at the shop listening to that. So then I wanted to pair that with that I did another one of my 365 names of God the other morning. And when you were just saying that when Paul said resurrection, it's not what we think of resurrection. Well, I found this in the Message Bible, and it's the first time that I ever really, I mean, I, I, when you say that about Paul knowing that you could overcome sin and overcome death. Like, I believe that, but I never really had a scripture to back it up. And as I read this to James, I wasn't sure, like, that everybody was going to get it in them like I did. But this is out of the Message Bible. It's 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 30. And why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I, do that, I would do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah, Jesus? And I th just thought as I read that, he can't possibly be talking about dying and being resurrected in, after his death. What would that have to do with what he's saying, you know? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beasts of Ephesus, hoping it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. It's resurrection, resurrection, always resurrection that undergirds what I do and say, the way I live. If there's no resurrection, we eat, we drink, the next day we die. Okay, if he's talking about resurrection being we eat, we drink, and the next day we die, this would not have no meaning, right? Uh-oh, I lost it. Where'd it go? When it works. A second. Was it really? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. This is a lot smaller on my phone than it is on my computer. Oh, not in your life. It's resurrection, resurrection, always resurrection that undergirds what I do and say the way I live. If there's no resurrection, we eat, we drink, the next day we die, and that's all there is to it. But don't fool yourselves. Don't let yourselves be poisoned by this anti-resurrection loose talk. Bad company ruins good manners. Think straight. Awaken to the holiness of life. No more playing fast and loose with no more playing fast and loose with resurrection facts. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford in times like these. Listen. It's not something we can afford in times like these. Aren't you embarrassed that you've let this kind of thing go on as long as you have? Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection, resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed. Soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visible likeness between seed and plant. The little bitty violet and the great big lily. And the cocoon, the, we've been talking a lot about the worm and the butterfly. There's no, like, was somebody just saying that the other day? You look at a butterfly and you can't, there's no resemblance. Were you saying that? Somebody, I knew somebody was. It doesn't look anything like it did when it was a worm. <laughs> There is no visible likeness between seed and plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. That's all.